I'm going to read through, you know, there's only 25 verses of John chapter 2. And every now and then, I like to do something called an atomic Bible study where I go over line by line by line by line by line. And honestly, John chapter 2 deserves several hours of looking at Scripture, 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 Scripture. And we only have about 30 minutes here. So I'm going to, just for your benefit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read all 25 verses to start off with. And then once I do that, I want you guys to be listening for the Holy Spirit to highlight something. Okay? So I, if, if you're brand new to Jesus, you might not even know how that works, that when the Word of God is read and when people are opening up the Word and you hear the Word of God being read, you should be listening to what makes your baby leap. You understand what I mean by that? There's something that, that rises up within you and the Holy Spirit is saying that right there. Many of you are going to just see something brand new in this that you've never seen no matter how many times that you've read it. And and many of you are also going to have something confirmed that God has already been speaking to you this week. This is how the Word of God works. King Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a scribe that pulls out of his bag things new and things old. So what is a scribe? It's somebody who interprets the Bible. And he says this is how it works. Every time, every single time that you're translating the Word of God, you're going to find something new and you're also going to have something confirmed. If you knew that, and if you really believed that, you and I would read the Bible a whole lot more than what we actually do. And so it's one of the motivators that I have in me reading the Word so much as I'm like, oh, I'm about to see something new, and I'm about to hear something confirmed. Somebody said that's good stuff. That is good stuff. Amen. So I'm just going to read this from the monitors, and... This is what it says in John chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Next verse, please. Verse 2. Keep on trucking. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to be to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, Well, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to his servants, yeah, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were set there are six water pots of stone. Now, according to the manner of the purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons, it says. And Jesus said to them, now, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And then he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast had said unto him, every man at the beginning, this is the next verse, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. But when the guests have all well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Now, the beginning of signs this beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum and his mother, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there for very many days. Now the Passover, the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went now up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing all kinds of crazy business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the changers' money and then he overturned all the tables. And he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, this is an Old Testament prophecy. It says, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and they said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, well, here's a good one. You destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it back up. Then the Jews said, dude, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're gonna raise it up again in just three days? But of course he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the words which Jesus had said. 
Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anybody should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. It's a lot, isn't it? So much in all this. One of the things that just stood out to me, and because I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get this far in the verse here over the next 22 minutes, is you know that whenever Jesus said, fill it up with water, and they did, and they filled it up with water, he said, now take a cup of that to the master of the feast. You realize it was still water when they pulled it out, right? And those guys had to take a cup of water going, Jesus wants you to taste his magic wine. It takes crazy people to see miracles. That really stands out to me just now. I don't know that I've ever saw that until, I'm, I probably have, but probably have preached on it. I'm probably gonna get hate mail now. Look, he preached this last year. Well, I forgot, I'm old, amen. But that really just now stood out to me in a really big way. That like, wow. It wasn't until the guy that was in authority judged it that everybody else knew what it was. That's very interesting. Going back to the very first miracle, you know, there's all these miracles that Jesus did, and the Bible only records 34 of them. Seems like there's a lot more recording than that. And of course, I, I say this all the time, that the book of John actually ends with John saying, if we were to write down all the miracles that Jesus did, the world could not contain the books. But the four gospels are very selective in picking 34 miracles that Jesus did. The first one being the water turned to wine. Very interesting. Now, this is important for a couple of different reasons because Jesus came to fulfill the law. And that doesn't mean he came to destroy it. That means he came to close the book on that section and completely finish it out so that we could go on to the next section. Now, when Moses came, Moses came to bring the law. And when Moses spoke to Pharaoh, the first of his sign was he turned the water into blood. So Jesus came, and his job was to turn the water into wine. Man, I tell you what, it's bad news when you turn water into blood. But it's good news as they testified that there would still be joy at the feast. Very interesting to me. Classic, amazing stuff. But this... John chapter 2, and remember, if, you, if you've gone through John chapter 1, and if you studied that with me, and I encourage you guys, go to odx.tv, look up my Atomic Bible Studies, as I tried very hard. I, I preached two sermons just on John 1.1. 1, 1. I never got past the first verse, and there's a lot of verses in, in that one. And so I just wanted to just skip over to 2 and say, if you went through chapter 1, you know that John's written very differently than the other three Gospels. It truly is. Um, it's written very much like Moses. It's written very much like, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John 1, 1 starts off, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, right? So it's, it starts off, it's like, no, listen, this is not from hanging out with Jesus. This is from going to the mountain with Jesus. So you guys will remember that the first, the, the book of Matthew, which is an amazing book, it's a book that is written to the Jewish people and it's, it shows Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. The second book, Mark, really shows the burden-bearing side of King Jesus in an incredible way. How that he was willing to actually bear the burdens and to pay the price that you and I needed him to pay. Brother Luke was blown away at the humanity of King Jesus. And you find in the book of Luke, Jesus getting angry. You find him getting sad. Uh, you find, you see him complaining. You know what? Everybody else got a place to stay, but I don't have a place to stay. You actually see the humanity of Jesus. And you also see the, the human story of the birth of Jesus, right? You see those things in the book of Luke. But man, when John saw Jesus, he just said, he's God. He's just, I'm telling you, he's, he's God. He's God in the flesh. He's not a dude pretending to be God, and he's also not God pretending to be a dude. He is 100% human being, but I promise you, he's 100% God. And so when he put together his book, he includes all kinds of prophetic insight and incredible things like this. How John chapter 2 starts off is this. On the third day, everybody say third day. Ah, oh, 
I would love to spend the rest of the time that I have just going through the third days in the Bible because there's so many. And it's a really good band, by the way, too, third day. I know, man, I, I loved that band. And it's like, okay, so on the third day, so he's, he's showing off, you know what, whenever, whenever Jesus did this, I would like to note that it's on the third day because he did these miracles through resurrection power. Resurrection power. And then this other part that we don't want to mess out, number one, on the third day, there was a wedding. I mean, I'm not going to be able to get past this verse, I'm telling you. On the third day, there was a wedding. Out of all the scenarios where the very first manif manifestation of the love of King Jesus and his dunamis power and, what, and how resurrection power would work, he could have chose all kinds of different settings. He chose a wedding. We serve a covenant God, don't we, guys? We serve a very, very, very covenant God out of all the things. And it's, it's very interesting to me because Jesus is acting like he's only there because his mama wanted him to be there. Now, obviously, this was a family friend. Obviously, this was somebody that Jesus knew. It was obviously somebody in the family because his brothers were there. His mama was there. And so he just now started this disciple thing, and now he brings the disciples there like, well, I guess we're going to a wedding. It's a very common part of Jewish culture. And you know what? It's going to be really good. But this is a really sad wedding because what's happening at this wedding is it's going to become very evident very, very, very quickly that they were as prepared as they could be, but they weren't prepared enough and there was nothing that they could do about it. Now, there's a guy that's actually in charge of that and he is, has an authority. Now, you know there's wedding coordinators today. He's something like the wedding coordinator and he's the one that says, no, no, that chair goes there. No, no, we honor these people first and you need to understand that a Jewish wedding is not a one-hour event. It goes on for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And there are ceremonial par parts, as was just illustrated with the six stone vases. Why? Because there's a ceremony where you clean your hands. So there's all these different parts of it. And the guy that does all that has to have his act together. And he's the guy that's going to bring in the rabbi. And he's the guy that's going to bring in the parents. And he's the guy that's going to make sure because you don't just have, you don't just eat one time. You might eat as many as three different times because it goes on all day long or it can go on even longer than a day. It's like depending on how long it takes for people to get into town, how long it takes for everybody to get together, right? Like this is not a one-hour event. And this wedding, you know, there's, there's an incredible event that's going to take place that I believe is immediately following the rapture of the church. And it's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And it's a place, guys, where we all sit at the same exact table and we are all the bride of King Jesus. And he says, finally, we're all together as family. We're finally together as family. You know that that's his greatest desire is for you and I to sit at the same table and be his actual family? That's not asking too much. It's sure not. I mean, as soon as Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the door being, show, the, the door being shut, the Bible says, he appeared into the 12th, and the first thing he said was, have peace, and then he said, do you have anything to eat? Whenever he told them to go to Galilee, they go all the way, they track the 70 miles up north, and they go all the way up there, and they're like, well, I don't know what else to do. Well, let's go fishing. So they go fishing, and while they're out there, there's, there's some, some, some joker that say, hey, did y'all happen to catch anything last night? And they're like, we really don't want to talk about it? No, we did not. So you know what the problem is? You're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. I want to tell you, I don't know if you've ever been in a fishing scenario before and somebody starts telling you how to fish right. It's very offensive. I, I'm not going to tell you. I have a couple of those stories. And I tell them, you need to be quiet. I'm going to fish how I want to fish. I don't even know who you are. Get away from me. I haven't seen you catch any fish either, right? And so this, that's a very offensive thing. And it's like, he shows up and he immediately offends them. And then they, they say, okay, well, we'll go ahead and we'll do that. And then they cast, it, they cast the net on the other side of the boat. They go to pull it up and it's, it's full of fish. And he's like, deja vu hits him. And though it didn't sound like Jesus, and though it didn't look like Jesus, it's exactly how Jesus found them to begin with. And it just, it hit every bell and whistle inside of Brother Peter's spirit. And he did the Lieutenant Dan Forrest Gump and just jumped right off the boat and took off swimming. 
He sure did. Okay, well, when he arrived there, Jesus was cooking some fish, and he's like, y'all want to eat together? <laughs> you keep seeing Jesus show up and saying, let's just sit down and eat. This, this agenda that he has for you and I to sit at the same table and to eat of the same supper is actually the Middle Eastern understanding of what family is. For you and I, the symbol is, in spite of the woke culture we live in, there is the symbol of you know, the silhouette of a man, the silhouette of a woman, and then, the, and then the silhouette of a child, right? That's not the symbol of family in the Bible. The symbol of family is we all sit at the same table. Everybody has a seat, everybody has a place, and it's something to be able to look at each other and say, look at what the Lord has done. It's incredible. We're all sitting here at the same table. Dude, how awesome is that? I love it. Yeah, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Let's do that. Uh, it's 818. I see 818 everywhere I go. Are there any other 818 people in here? Yeah, look at all these weirdos. Oh, yeah, I'm a big time 818 guy. Yeah, right on. I'm all about it. It's a new beginning of life. Eight is new beginnings. 18 is life or lachaim, right? Also, Deuteronomy 818 is the power to gain wealth scripture. Just thought I'd throw that out there. You're welcome. That was free. All right. So, yeah, I'm not going to get past first verse. I'm glad I read the whole thing to you. So on the third day, everybody say third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Ah, oh, gosh, guys, look, I want to preach on Cana of Galilee for a long time, but will you guys just search out the matter and find out where Cana is? And the reason why it says it's Cana of Galilee is because that means it's on the lake, right? It's on the Sea of Galilee. And the interesting thing about, there's a lot of interesting things about Galilee. It's teeming with fish. It's beautiful. And it is in the shape of a harp. Okay? Then you go down the river, the Jordan River, and it goes into the Dead Sea, which is in the shape of a tear. It's in the shape of a tear. And nothing lives in it. It's completely dead. There's not a single fish that lives in the Dead Sea because it is, yeah, exactly. They both have the same water in it. Like, what is the difference? The difference is baptism. The difference is baptism. I'm going to move on. All right. So, on the third day, everybody say on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now say this. Are you ready? And the mother of Jesus was there. It's a big deal because, you know, not that she had any choice, but Mary happened to be there the day that Jesus was born. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? I pulled that out of Scripture. That's a personal revelation that God gave me. But what you also find is she's there at the very first time that Jesus confronts the Pharisees. Very first time anybody ever heard him speak publicly. And then you find she's there at the very first miracle that Jesus ever did, John chapter 2, verse 1. And then you find her throughout the ministry of Jesus, including at the cross of Jesus, Mary was there. And then the Bible says, after Jesus had ascended, after he had resurrected from the dead, after he had walked among them for 40 days and ascended into heaven, 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, she was one of the 120 in the upper room. Mary saw it all. It, I think sometimes we're, as Protestants, I think that, that we've really been walked in error in trying to, not to make too big of a deal out of Mary because, you know, of what we come from. We obviously do not worship her. We obviously don't pray to her. Um, there's no statues in here of Mary. There's also not um, a sword-swallowing pole dancer going to arrive here tonight. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, we don't have any of that going on. I'm going to continue. Thank you. Look at Pastor Gloria's wondering, what in the world am I talking about? It's okay. You haven't missed anything, Pastor Gloria. Everybody else in here knows. Now that I've said all that, I... I think it's been a big mistake, man, for us not to look at Mary and be in awe of her. 
and just go, wow. Now, I don't know how you react when the angel of the Lord shows up and talks to you. Okay, she had not rehearsed that. She didn't have a, 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 a counsel. She was a teenage girl, and her conclusion was, let it be as the Lord has spoken unto me. Now look, you might rehearse that your entire life and still fail on the day that the angel shows up. Just that. And also, too, exactly what the angel said was, oh my gosh, you're the most blessed woman. You have no idea how famous you are in heaven. You are blessed among all women. God talks about you all the time, Mary. And then the Bible says she cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. That means she went, row, row, he's got the wrong address. Because she had never one time had she ever been called blessed, much less blessed among all women. Man. And then I think about when she was laying on her back with animals around her, and the only person there to help that poor girl have her baby was her knucklehead husband. And she's laying there thinking, is this supposed to feel this way? Something's wrong. Something's bad, bad wrong. This is not how this is supposed to go. This is not good. That she's thinking in her, in her mind what the angel of the Lord had spoken unto her nine months earlier and said, hell, Mary, you're blessed. She's like, yeah, I'm so blessed. To be able to believe the word of God when you can't see it and when nobody else can see it, and when you have such a bad reputation that the family tells you there's no room for you to stay here, but we know where the animals stay, you can go out there. And then to see her there as a 12-year-old, Jesus says, I don't know why you were looking for me. Didn't you know I'd be about your, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And she went, no, you do what I tell you to do. And he went, okay. That's how that went down. It says, and he became subject to her. There might have been a spanking involved in that. I don't know. It's like, don't make me take off my shoe. I don't know if y'all know what that's all about. I know what that's all about. And she went, no, the time is not yet. And then what we find at the miracle of, the, of Cana in Galilee is that Jesus tells her, no, my time is not yet. And she goes, yes, it is. Today's a great day to start. Let's get this thing on. And he does it. Why? Because he was subject to her concerning the timing. The Bible says that he, was, he became subject to her when he was 12. And he remained subject to her timing until he was 30 years old. That's a huge responsibility. And then for her to be there at the cross and see all that go down. And then for her to be one of the last men standing, and she wasn't even a man. Isn't that just the way it always is, girls? <laughs> Jesus tells thousands of people, you guys need a terry for 10 days. Wait till you see what's going to happen. And there's only 120 left, and Mary is among them. So that means Mary and her friends were a big part of that. Y'all don't think she was there all by herself now, do you? Because she wasn't. She was surrounded by her posse by now. And I guarantee you, they were not men. When the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, I promise you Mary was there. The Bible says she was, which also means that her friends were there as well. Now, I would, I want to get ready to close. I told you I wasn't going to get past the first verse. But I want, to, I want to get ready to close on this and say this. The thing that I love about Mary is she's a woman of all seasons, she can walk with God in every single season. And now that is very unusual because most people only, even everyone, the greatest um, men and women of God you've ever known, what's real is if you actually study their history, their exploits for the kingdom were typically only for one small part of their life. It wasn't like, Hey, when they were young, they were Jesus freaks. When they were middle-aged, man, they did it. When they were old age, they did it, and then they died well. That's very rare. That's a, that's, a, that's a John the Baptist. That's a Joseph. That is a Daniel. That's very, very, very rare. Most people only serve God in a tremendous way for a small period of their life. 
I, those, you're like, oh, well, they weren't saved. No, they still end up in the Hall of Fame of Faith. You can go to Hebrews chapter 11, and you can see, no, God's, God's not ashamed to be called their God. But what's real is, there was a great season in their life where they were able to walk with God, but there were other seasons that they really messed up bad. David, of course, is in there, right? Go through the Hall of Fame of Faith. It's incredible. Well, there's 19 people that are actually listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And like, you know, what about Gideon and his 300? Wow, amazing. I love me some Gideon. I don't like the rest of his life. You know, the brother had 70 sons. He needed a television. <laughs> brother had 70 boys. It doesn't say how many girls he had. Did you know, though, that because of a bunch of wickedness in his house, one of his sons rose up and killed the other 69? It's one thing, no parents should have to go to a child's funeral. It's another thing to go to 69 of them in one day. And we could go through the humanity of all these great men and women of God, and the blessing of the Lord is upon them, and they were amazing human beings that, as Hebrews 11 says, had to live in tents, didn't know where they were going, were ostracized, were beat up, and didn't see miracles happen. And they're still in the Hall of Fame of Faith because they loved God. They just didn't know how to walk victoriously in some phases of their life in certain places that they lived in. But there are others that they're bad motor scooters. And Mary is at the heap of that list. She's a woman of all seasons. I was going to go see Pastor David Musicha one year and see my friends in Uganda, East Africa, and I was on a 777 from London to uh, Entebbe, and I was at the very back of the plane as I had to travel for so many years, and I was sitting back there, and my big giant body was in one little bitty tiny seat, and I was paying attention to everybody that got up and left, and I was looking around to see if there were any two seats together so that I wouldn't spill over into the seat of the person next to me. Fat people worry about these things. So I'm like, okay. And so I'm looking and looking and looking and looking and looking, and we just got up, and everybody's getting settled in, and I knew that once we got up at a certain altitude, that the, that the stewardess would not mind if I got up and took a more comfortable seat. So I'm watching. I'm at the very back, very last row, right by the galley, right by the bathrooms, and I'm sitting there, I'm looking, and as I'm looking, I see this guy walking down the aisle, and he is a tough-looking bird. He is Ugandan, he's wearing a suit, and as he's kind of moving through people like this, I see he has a gun in his vest. That got my attention. So when he came by me, me being, this is 20, 25 years ago, I was a lot younger than I am now, I'm like, hey man, is that a Glock? <laughs> Just let everybody know, this brother, this joker's got a gun. And he looked at me and went, yeah, it is a Glock. He goes, how do you know that? Are you in security? I said, no, I'm Texan, hallelujah. <laughs> like what I tell you. It's a true story. <laughs> so we stood up back there, we talk, and we're both shooting a bull, and I said, what's going on? And he said, he said, the president of Uganda is on this plane, and he's at the front of the plane. And I'm part of his security detail. He went to London because his daughter just had a baby. President Museveni. And I said, wow, no kidding. I was like, have you worked for him for a long time? And he said, yes, I've worked for him for many years. I said, please tell me what President Museveni is like. And he said, well, he is a man of all seasons. And I wrote that down. I wrote it down, a man of all seasons. And I, because I asked him, well, what does that mean? He says, you know, when we need, when he was a young man and we needed a, you know, we needed a warrior to come in, he was that. When we needed him to be somebody else, he was that. When we went through another phase, we needed him to be that, he was that. He said, I can tell you, sir, that he is a man of all seasons. And I went back to my seat and I began to weep before the Lord. And I was beginning to say, Lord Jesus, let it be said of me someday that I was a man of all seasons. Don't let me spend decades messed up. Don't let me twist off. 
God, let it be said of me that when I was young, I fell in love with Jesus. When I was, when I was in my 20s, I started the church and I did it. When I was in my 30s, I went throughout the world. When I was in my 40s, I started, I started saving kids. When I was in my 50s, this happened. When I was in my 60s, this happened. When I was in the 70s, and I stayed with you, King Jesus. I'm still praying that prayer. And so this is how John chapter two, verse one puts it. And it's really prophetic the way it's written, if you have an eye to see it. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Awesome. Well, that was pretty painless, right on, except for one little part, and I repented. <laughs> I want to ask you guys to stand up if you would. Hallelujah. My goodness. The Lord is good, my friends. God is good. You know, it's going to be said of you somewhere, so I'm, I'm saying. Uh, you know, Jesus did this amazing thing, and you were there. That's a big deal. You know, we think that God doesn't see all those things. To be able to say, I saw the miracle that, that Pastor David did. I saw when, he, when his tank was completely empty, and he still said, no, I'm not, I am not taking a dime from you. I'm selling everything I have into that. You put it all together, and you go give it to the people in the Mexican trash dump. I saw him do that. I, you know what? The story will be told of the miracle that happened with him, but it might also be written, and Troy was there. I was there. I was there and I was sleeping on people's floors all over London, people that I didn't know, and eating their food and then leaving. Hallelujah. You're welcome. No, I was. I was preaching in churches I'd never preached at before. I was doing the thing. I was out there <sighs> preaching the gospel. It's going to be said of you someday, just like it says about the mother of Jesus. <laughs> The story is about the first of the miracle working power examples of King Jesus. But in the very first verse it says, oh, and by the way, Mary was there. Do you know that God does that? Think, well, I don't deserve any credit. There's no reason for me to have any credit. And God says, oh no, by the way, I saw that you were there. You were in on that. I love that. Don't you love that? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, God, for knowing, God, when we are there and counting it. Father, thank you, Lord, for choosing Mary. Jesus, we love your mama. We're so proud of her. May we have the character of that amazing lady. I pray, God, that we would not bail the good days, the bad days, when we are alone by ourselves. When we are in the crowd, when we're counted among the 120, or we're the few standing on the worst day there ever was at the cross, let it be said that we didn't leave, but that we were there. Holy Spirit, I feel your presence right here, right now. I'm so grateful for it. Do great things. Yes, Lord. Friends, that's the Holy Ghost you're feeling right there. I feel the Holy Spirit. That's the goodness of the Lord. Friends, Jesus loves you so much. You know that it's in this kind of setting that miracles happen. It's in this kind of setting that people get saved. It's in this kind of setting that families get restored, that simple solutions to complicated issues begin to take place. If you're somebody in need of a touch from King Jesus, whether that is salvation or healing, or you just want to come before the Lord, maybe it's actually repentance. Maybe it's actually, I don't even know what I'm here for. I just want more. I want to tell you, my friends are standing by right now, and we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing ministry up here. Guys, I love you so much. Call you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and highly favored of the Lord. Good night, everybody. Come on, Jesus. We love you, Lord.